Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Jesus Christ is the living word, the word made flesh who came to dwell among us. Jesus Christ is living water who sustains a weary world with hope and love. Jesus Christ is the great table host whose joyful feast offers us all abundant life. Friends, it's time to turn off our cell phones and our smartwatches. Not just the sound, but the vibration, too. It's even time to put a piece of duct tape on the face of our analog watches. It's Christmas Eve, when time stands still for a moment. Here we are invited into a timeless story. For tonight, we are both here and on a hillside outside of Bethlehem. Tonight we are here with each other, some of us via technology, friends and family, returning students and relatives from far away. And we are also with the Magi, still journeying, still following the star. Tonight we listen to angelic music and we listen to choirs of angels, a whole heavenly host of angels that we have heard on high. Tonight, like every night, is new, a never happening before a moment in onrushing time, and yet, we have been here before. We have done this before. We have told this story before. We have heard it before. There is a way that the story we tell tonight is always happening, birth and death and taxes, weary travelers, crowded homes, babies born, sudden signs of grace and glory, surprising generosity. The past and the present are closely woven tonight in the ordinary and the extraordinary experience of the incarnation. Tonight we will receive a visible sign of grace at the table. Tonight we will see the radiance and beauty of this story reflected on faces, in songs, and in prayers offered in the soft glow of candles. Friends, come. It is Christmas Eve. Let us worship together. Let's join our voices now in number 76 in your red hymnals, O Come All Ye Faithful.
us pray. O Emmanuel, O wisdom from on high, O Lord of might, O branch of Jesse's stem, O key of David, O bright and morning star, O king of nations, we rejoice and are glad on this Christmas Eve, for truly you have come full of grace and truth. Even now, come into our hearts again. Show us the path of knowledge. Comfort us in our mourning. Save us from our sin. Open wide our way to you. Turn our darkness into light. End our sad divisions and be our king of peace. So that every creature in heaven and on earth will join in the chorus of praise and shout with joy to you, our Lord. Amen. Amen. To those who are called, who are beloved in God and kept safe in Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. And together God's people said, Amen. Loving, and now may the peace of Christ be with you. Please share a sign of that peace with those around you. As we come to hear from God's word, let us pray. Loving God, by the gift of your spirit, teach us, like Mary, to treasure your words and ponder them in our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, your word made flesh. Amen. Tonight's Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you with joy at the harvest as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all of the boots that tramping warriors and the garments rolled in blood shall be burned for fuel for fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be an endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And this, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Oh, never mind. <laughs> For now.
from the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Let us attend to the word of the Lord. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. Declare these things, exhort and reprove with all authority, and let no one look down on you. And this, my brothers and sisters, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and redeemer. And now, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. But Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, 
keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they, they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Now when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds looked at one another. Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard as it had been told them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now, it's easy to forget in our world, which is a a wash in written words, but the gospel writers were very intentional with their word choices. Parchment and ink weren't abundant, and the need to be pointed and precise with one's written words was crucial. So it's important to always pay close attention to the way the gospel writers start various sections of their writings. And while really it's just frankly important to pay attention to anything that they've written down. Now our reading tonight starts with that famous decree that goes out from Emperor Augustus. Perhaps one of the most famous decrees of all time. Now early gospel readers and believers, their ears would have perked up at the name Emperor Augustus. Now for those of you who have forgotten your history of the Roman Empire or who failed to pay attention in class that day... Emperor Augustus was the first emperor of the Roman Empire. After consolidating his control over the various warring Roman states, he ruled for 41 years and is considered by many to be one of the greatest political leaders of all time. Born Gaius Octavius, he was given the title Augustus after coming to power in 27 BC. Now in Latin... Augustus roughly translates to the illustrious one. It's meant to evoke a godlike quality to Emperor Augustus's role. Now, Emperor Augustus was also known for establishing the Pax Romana, which was a 200-year period of relative peace and stability in the Roman Empire. There were certainly wars and rebellions and the like, but nothing on the scale of what had been seen prior. Now, during this golden age, Rome expanded its borders, its trade, its power, and eventually came to have a population of roughly 70 million people across almost all of Europe, northern Africa, and the western Asian continent. It was a remarkable time in human history. Now, I would guess, hopefully, someone at this point is thinking, why is Eric talking so much about a Roman emperor? Perhaps the sinus cold he's getting over is going to his head. I did not take Sudafed before this for that very reason. This is Christmas Eve for crying out loud, Eric. Where is baby Jesus? He's online. No, I'm just kidding. Remember, remember what I noted earlier about the gospel writers being precise in their language. Everyone hearing this narrative would know who Emperor Augustus was, even if the Gospel of Luke was written sometime 50 to 60 years after Augustus had died. Hearing the name Emperor Augustus would get them thinking of this Roman emperor who styled himself a god and everything else that he, his rule entailed. And Luke sets the stage then too with this decree from Emperor Augustus, right? That that went out declaring that all the world should be registered. This all the world is important to note too. It gives the sense that Augustus believed that he did indeed control all of the world. Quite a sign of hubris 
and confidence. And stay with me here. So after this decree and the noting of Quirinius as governor, our narrative then shifts pretty drastically to Joseph and Mary, two nobodies, right, traveling back to Joseph's hometown to be registered. While there, Mary has her baby and wraps him in bands of cloth. Right, these four verses depicting this travel and this birth show nothing out of the ordinary. Right? There's nothing wildly uncommon or miraculous. And it gets even more interesting, or perhaps less interesting, when we head to the shepherds. The shepherds in this era were about as far from the empiric halls of power as you could get. I mean, these shepherds aren't even shepherds for the emperor or like a cool governor or a general or something. Right there, a couple thousand miles away from the halls of power in Rome, in the fields outside of some podunk town. And the shepherds are just tending their flock when who should appear? An angel of the Lord who told them not to fear. Thank you, someone got it. And this is it, right here. You've got Emperor Augustus with all of his power and his Pax Romana, and the angels arrive to shepherds, and they say this, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. The good news of great joy isn't coming from good old Emperor Augustus or because of what he's doing. It's coming from a village of roughly 300 people. It's coming because a baby has been born to a young, engaged couple who have been struggling to make sense of how their lives have been completely turned upside down. It's coming to shepherds watching their fields by night. This is where the good news of great joy is coming from. In pondering this, I'm reminded here of Paul's words to the church in Corinth. When Paul writes, God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Because God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are. Emperor Augustus can have his supposed godlike title and his supposed rule of the entire world in his so-called Pax Romana, but the real salvation of the world, the real Prince of Peace, the real and true God is lying in a manger thousands of miles away from him. And this continues to be one of the most compelling and hopeful aspects of the Christmas narrative. That God continues to work in ways that confound the ways of the world. For the world would like us to believe that true and ultimate power lies in the hands of governments and politicians and corrupt and cor corporations and big multinational companies. The world would like us to believe that only those with status and money and prestige matter. The world would like us to believe that it's through power wielding and the domination of others that we get ahead and make a difference. And yet, year after year after year, we read the story of God coming to the earth as a helpless baby. Year after year, we read the story of angels visiting people like Mary and Joseph and the lowly shepherds. Year after year, we read this story that starts with Emperor Augustus, but moves on and never mentions him again. Friends, these words from Luke serve as our yearly reminder, not just of quaint and nostalgic Christmas stories, but the reality that God moves in ways that are counter to the world's ways. Wheaton-based biblical scholar Esau Macaulay puts it this way. This Christmas story is a challenge to certain muscular forms of Christianity that suggest we need political or physical might to overcome our enemies. It rebukes modern strongmen who believe that they can bend history to their will through the strength of arms. It gives lie to the claim that Christians must adopt the pugilistic posture of a society at war with itself to accomplish God's purposes. He goes on, if the Christmas story reveals anything, it shows 
that God chose weakness and vulnerability as a means of calming the fears of a troubled world. That same weakness reappeared during the crucifixion when Jesus chose to love his enemies to the end rather than take vengeance upon them. Christmas in Christ is the antithesis of that retributive way of carrying on and is pacifist at his core. Friends, on this cold and blustery Christmas Eve, may we find once again that this story calls us to a different way of living. May we trust that God's foolishness is far wiser than human wisdom and that God's weakness is stronger than any human strength. May we open our ears and eyes to the way that God is moving and continues to move in unexpected ways and in unexpected places. May the profundity of the incarnation that we experience here tonight never cease to leave us awestruck and grateful that God so loved the world that he sent his Son to save us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.
beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ. This meal that we're about to celebrate is a feast. It's a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. This is a place that we come to remember the fullness, the, the full story of God's love for us. That story that we're remembering particularly tonight in the birth of Jesus. The word made flesh for us, for our salvation. And we, we remember at this table really not just that birth, but the fullness of Christ's life and the ways that Jesus walked among us and knew what it was like to be human like us, but also showed us a different way to live, a different way to love, a different way to react to people like Emperor Augustus. We remember that God's love involves humility and grace and truth. This place, too, is a place of communion. It's a place that we gather together. Those of us who are right now in this time and place here in this room, but also those who are in their own living rooms, those who will watch this service another day, those who are gathering with other sisters and brothers. Somehow, through the power of the Holy Spirit, this is the place that brings us all together. And we all find ourselves drawn in to the very presence of Christ, that place of grace and truth. And this place, too, is a place of hope, because we live in a world of Emperor Augustuses. We live in a world of pain and death. We live in a world of snowstorms that disrupt. And yet, we hold to a bigger story, a bigger picture of what God is doing in this world. And this place, this little taste of bread and juice, somehow tell us a different story. A bigger story of grace and truth, a story of God's glory one day revealed. And this little taste is the thing that invites us to continue to come together to continue to live and to love differently in the ways that Jesus taught us, to be about reconciliation, to be about hope, to be about grace and about truth. This is not our table. It's not Second Church's table. It's Jesus Christ's table. And Jesus is the host who invites us to come to feast here tonight. So whether this is a place you come often or a place you have not been for a long time, know that it is Jesus who invites you here. Come. Come and meet Jesus here. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and right it is and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. O Lord, our creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence but you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word made flesh for us and for our salvation, for the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you. We praise and we bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name.
righteous God. We remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. And together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Every time you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they had eaten together, he took the cup, and he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless are the communion of the body and blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God given for us, the people of God. We invite you to partake in communion tonight by coming forward down the center aisle. We'll hand you a piece of bread. You can take a cup from either side and return to your seats by the outer aisle. If you prefer to be served in your seat, an elder is available to serve you there. Ask our elders to come forward at this time.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, Holy One, for the world of wonder you have made, forest and field, sea and sky, and for the gift of grace that you have given, a little child lying in a manger. Thank you for feeding us at your table today, a table that reminds us of the immeasurable gifts of your grace and love. In the face of this good news proclaimed here tonight, we pray that no powerful nation should tax the poor or uproot them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that no unmarried mother should be put away in disgrace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that no door will be shut on those who need to find it open. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that shepherds and sheep and all of nature need not be afraid. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that barbed wire and angry soldiers may not be found in Bethlehem. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that wise men and wise women might appear in Russia, in Myanmar, in China, in Nicaragua, all around the world and in all halls of power. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that children may be protected from those who would abuse them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that this Christmas, worship may become a manger and the church a stable and the rumor become a reality that Christ has come among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray all of these prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we continue to bask in the light and the wonder of the Incarnation, let us join our voices in singing together number 92, Joy to the World.
ascending litany and benediction. Jesus is the word made flesh in our midst. May his incarnation fill your hearts with joy and peace. O oh Lord, Lord, give, give us, us peace. Jesus is the promised Savior born of Mary. May his birth among us renew your hope. O oh Lord, Lord, give, give us, us hope. hope. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. May the gift of his presence bring forth rejoicing. O oh oh Lord, Lord, give, give us, us joy. joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.